I think we can start, right? So we continue considering the singularities of, uh, fun of holomorphic functions, and in particular, we'll study in details a little bit more the case of uh, uh, poles, okay? Last time, we, we, uh, we classified the singularities. There are only three possibilities. One is the not interesting case, if you want. It is the case of removable singularities. Then we have poles and essential singularities. We characterize them, okay? Now, let me just uh, remind you that last time we considered uh, a half uh, holomorphic, say, and this, which from now on will be the punctured disk centered at A, right? <coughs> I repeat just for the sake of completeness. that I mean this, okay? So we are dealing with a domain which is a disk and well, we remove the center and the center is A. So locally, all singularities are like this, right? Um, and assume that A is a pole for F, correct? So a pole for F means well, we have uh, given characterization of a pole, but essentially f of z has a principal part. Remember, we, we described the principal part, and then, a, and then it is summed to a holomorphic function. So you have something like c minus m over c minus a to the power m plus c minus m plus 1 over z minus m, sorry, z minus a over m minus 1, then plus c minus 1, c minus a plus c naught plus, plus something which is not surprising, not surprising what you expect to have. That is to say, this part here is in fact the standard power expansion at a. Okay? So if all these CIs are in fact zero, the function is, is holomorphic. Or it has, as we said, a removable singularity to be more correct. So it has a uh, removable singularity if in fact can be extended holomorphically at A. Right? But if one, at least, okay, is not, uh, is not uh, uh, zero of these CIs, and necessarily, there is a singularity, and the function is not defined at A, okay? But it has a pole because the number of CIs are, uh, is finite. Otherwise, we, we, had, we would have uh, uh, um, an essential singularity. This is the characterization. So let me just consider the case that A is a pole for F. What if we consider the integral of f of z of the closed curve, and of course I always omit that it is sufficient to regular to make this calculation, blah, 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 okay, uh, closed curve in d dot a r, <coughs> okay? Remember, this was called the principal part of the function f, right? And this was, well, the, 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 the not surprising part in some sense. It was the holomorphic, standard holomorphic power expansion, okay? So notice that as we already done several times, we can split uh, the integrals we are considering here in this way. So we have the integral of a gamma of f c dz as the integral of, of a gamma of, so the principal part of f dz, well, if, I, if you 
allow me to use this notation, plus the integral over gamma of summation pk c minus a to the power k is here. And this gives you 0. Why? Because this is the integral over a cover closed curve. OK, this is holomorphic in the disk. So we are exactly in the same situation as we considered in, uh, be before starting, with, before taking into consideration singularity. So this is 0. But here we have what? A finite number of summons. Huh? So in particular, so write, let me write this explicitly like this, c minus m, z minus a to the power m denominator plus, I can split because the integral is linear, minus m plus 1 over z minus m, a m minus 1 plus dz plus. So <coughs> This is zero because it's a constant, so it's holomorphic. This all, but not the first one. So the one with the the, the index one hmm, are in fact also giving zero contribution to the integral because, as we already noticed, when considering the first examples of the uh, um, of the complex integration then we observe that when you have this to be calculated on a closed curve, okay, each of this, when k is different from minus 1, each of these functions uh, has a primitive, remember? So also this function is a primitive, and therefore the integral is 0. So the only contribution is this is given by this factor. So that we can say, the important thing I'm, I'm summarizing here, that if f, if f is holomorphic in the dot a r and a is a pole for f then for any closed curve in for any closed curve gamma in d a r the dot a r we have that the integral you can't see anything I'm sorry. Maybe this is okay. It's much better, right? So uh, you have to wait a little bit because I think that that my hand, the color of my hand, changes the 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 focus and probably also the you know diaphragm. <laughs> okay. So be patient, please. <laughs> and well, this is not zero. Otherwise, the function f would be holomorphic, of course, but then we can be more precise and say, well, from this calculation, we can say this is this integral all the others are in fact have in fact zero contribution to the integral, and so this is c minus one of what two pi i the index, sorry, n gamma a, right? So this coefficient is very important and is called, for some historical reason, residue of the pole a. Okay, this is the residue, and this okay, and this number is in general, in general it is not zero. All right, good. Right. 
On the other hand, from the above given description of a pole, local description of a pole, we can also say that if F has a pole at A, then we can write Fz to be z minus a to the power minus m, okay, times g of z, where g of z is holomorphic. Okay. Remember, we have a principal part, then holomorphic part, then we can rescale the coefficient in such a way that we have this factor, okay, which is the leading somehow term. <laughs> Okay, this is, uh, largest M is like this, okay. Remember that M is known as the order of the pole. I think that I already told you last time this, okay. So M is, of course, M. So it's not one of the M's, it's the largest, okay. Then we can factor out M and then consider the other coefficients and factors, but then, of course, this G of Z, which comes out from this factorization, is holomorphic. It has power expansion, it's complex analytic, okay? So, keeping in mind this, and remembering what we have done for the zeros, what if we calculate this ratio? Okay? So we have to differentiate the f of z, which is, in this expression, very easy to calculate. So m minus m, z minus m, minus m, then what? Minus 1 times g of z plus z minus a to the power minus m, g prime of z. And then I have z minus a to the power minus m, G of Z, which means that what we have here is minus M, correct, Z, okay, plus G prime of Z over G of Z, which is similar except for this minus in front <laughs> to the case of the zero. Remember that when a was a zero, we factor out z minus a to the power m, m was the multiplicity of the zero, and we show that in this ratio, the, the, the part which was not uh, so trivial for the calculation of the integral was like this, with a plus, remember, in front. Hmm? So, if now I take the integral over gamma of f prime over f, z and gamma is a closed curve. As usual, I'm assuming it's sufficiently regular to make this calculation and reasonable. It means that it is defined where the functions are defined. Okay. Then I have minus m integral of 1 over z minus a dz plus g pr integral of a gamma g prime of z of and okay what we know is that g is holomorphic and g of a is not zero okay we also have this so this <coughs> integral here on the right hand side is the last term in the, in the final expression is zero because counts no zero, okay. Okay, so this is zero, and here we have a minus in m times what the index of a with respect to gamma. In other words, we have this fundamental fact. So, if f is holom is sorry, 
is holomorphic in D. Okay. Domain of C. Okay. Assume the one the k's are zeros of D and W one WK are the poles of of F, sorry, of F in D of F in D. So I consider just a finite number of zeros because if there were infinitely many, there can be infinitely many. In any case, then I take the integral of a closed curve so that I will, as you remember, consider just the the, this, the, the, the subsets of zeros and of poles which are contained in the bounded complement of the curve. Remember? So I take a curve gamma homologous to zero closed curve and I don't care about poles and zero which are outside. So outside means in the unbounded component of the complement of gamma. Why I'm not considering them? Because I know that the index with respect to gamma of poles and of zero or any point is zero. So that what we are interested in is what is inside. Okay? So then I can restrict to the case of a finite number of zero and a finite number of poles. Otherwise, those which are infinite because I have to say, if I consider the closed curve and the subset which is which has as a contour this closed subset, this closed curve, okay, if there were infinitely many zeros inside, okay, these zeros would converge to a point either inside or to the boundary. But we are assuming that the closed curve is not passing through any zero or Pole, okay, which is not passing through uh, zeros and poles. Okay, so in the previous, in our previous consideration, we considered curve gamma in D dot, hmm? which means they cannot pass through point A, so the, cent the, the, the pole, right? So what I have is that when I consider the integral over gamma of f prime of z, f of z, and then I multiply 1 over 2 pi i in this integral, this gives you what? This gives us, well, we already know if the function were holomorphic, this gives us the multiplicity of each zero times the index. But in this case, we have also poles added. So it's a more generic situation. And we have seen locally for one pole, but then we repeat it to all the, to, the all, to each pole and repeat it k times. What, huh? So this is the difference of what? Of, uh, as I say, right, summation of mj and gamma j, this is multiplicity of zero zj. And I know that this sum is a finite sum because of what I said before. Minus summation, and then I put here maybe m tilde uh, L and gamma W L, where this M tilde is the order of the pole Z L, uh, sorry, W L, W L. Okay, so this number 
is the difference of the indexes of zeros times multiplicities minus the difference and poles times order, sum of poles and order. If you prefer to avoid this notation because this can be somehow hard to remember, then you sum the index how, uh, how many, uh, so many times as the number of the, the inverse image of zero, so it has the multiplicity and you sum the index, okay, so that you can in some sense consider a multiple zero as a zero counted several times as a simple zero. So in general, this is, well, this result is known as the argument principle. And then we'll see uh, some application of this argument principle. So if this integral is zero, it doesn't mean that the function has no zero and no poles. It can be as many zero, as many poles with multiplicities, for instance. Okay, and that's what when we'll take the application, we'll see in detail. Okay. So now, just to give you some extra uh, uh, terminology, a function uh, which is holomorphic. and has as singularity as singularities only poles will be called a meromorphic function These two words, holomorphic, these two adjectives, holomorphic and meromorphic, are Greek words. Okay. So meromorphic means function with singularities, which are either removable. If they are all removable, so the function is simply holomorphic, and the singularities can be only poles, not essential singularities. Okay. So a function which is meromorphic can be extended to the singularities by putting that. Well, assume that. The pole, if F is meromorphic and W is a pole for F, then we can extend F to a function F tilde, which agrees elsewhere, but at W, assume the value infinite if you want to extend it to the Riemann sphere, just to have, okay, a more general uh, uh, notation for, for meromorphic functions. So let me show you one of the first applications of the, of the, the consideration given for poles and for, for um, zeros of holomorphic, meromorphic function in general, okay? Of course, any, sorry, any holomorphic function can be considered as a special case of meromorphic function, so no poles, okay, if you wish. So the great difference between poles and essential singularities. So let me see if I can state this, which is known in some book as Ruchet's theorem. Okay, assume that F and G are meromorphic functions in D. Right? Um, let gamma be a uh, 
closed curve and D non not passing through zeros and poles of F and G. Okay. So, I have this situation, I have domain, I have some poles of one function, some zeros, okay. and then I take a curve, a curve gamma. Since these are poles and zeros are isolated, I can always find enough room okay, to, to move okay, this curve. Then I assume, assume that this inequality holds on gamma, along gamma for any uh, t, t in i. So, gamma is a function like this, okay. i is the interval we are considering, it is an interval in r. Hmm? We have that f of gamma of t minus g of gamma of t. So, the values taken of the functions f and g meromorphic along the curve. This is a finite number because these numbers are all complex numbers, right? This is strictly less than f of gamma t. Right? So, this is an assumption. This is meaningful because the curve gamma is not passing through any poles. Okay, so that yeah. then then so this is just the assumptions of then the number of zeros minus the number of poles of sorry of uh, indexes okay of zero the number of indexes of poles <coughs> counted with multiplicity respectively order of the two functions f and g uh, are the same, but I have to be more precise of the zeros and pole uh, counted with multiplicity and and the bounded region of c minus gamma. I can also omit this, but of course, I have to repeat then that what is outside the curve gamma is not counted for our considerations because the index is zero. So, probably the notation I gave you so far is not very uh, convenient and let me just use the standard notation when I have a meromorphic function the number of zeros is normally denoted by z of f. Zeros with multiplicity, or sometimes I use this symbol, same symbol for the set. Okay, but while this should be somehow the cardinality of the set of each zero times the multiplicity minus, and then normally you write this way, okay? P of f to remember that p is the pole. Okay? So this sums up this difference. So, this is more precisely summation of m j and gamma z j and this number here is summation of m tilde j and gamma w j with the previous notations. Okay? So, in short, if I adopt this notation, the 
theorem states the following. Take the curve, consider this, which of course depends on gamma. Huh? I omit gamma, but I have to remember this is depending on gamma. Huh? This difference of zeros minus poles, okay, counted with multiplicity for the curve f, for the function f is the same for, sorry, for g. Okay, this is Ruscha theorem statement. Okay. Now, probably it's longer to describe the theorem than to prove it. First of all, let me remark that this inequality we have along the curve gamma, strict inequality implies, this is for any t in i, right? that f has no zeros, right? And along gamma, because otherwise it would be zero greater than something which is greater or equal to zero, right? So that I can divide, right? And I take the difference, oh, sorry, this, Therefore, therefore, this is true. What do we have here? Well, we have the ratio of two meromorphic functions. Is it meromorphic? So we know that the, the ratio of two holomorphic function, think about the exercises I gave you, when it is defined, it is holomorphic, but in general, it is not defined in the same domain. So what are the problems? The problems are where the denominator vanishes. So in this case, there are the zeros of f to, take it to, to be taken into consideration. And in fact, this adds some poles to this ratio, because you have the poles of g and then other poles, right? So, but what we have is a finite number of poles in any case, and not extra singularities. Hmm? So this function here is meromorphic. What we also have from this inequality is something interesting. When we restrict to t in i in the interval, and then we see the, well, this call this function if you want h, okay? h of gamma of t is the image of the curve gamma with respect to this meromorphic function. Okay. What do we know about this meromorphic function h? Well, we know that when t varies in i, gamma of t is not passing through any of the zeros of g, of f, and the pole, so it is a curve. So this is a curve, call it sigma of t. So we don't know very much about this curve, but the distance from 1 is smaller than 1. This is the only fact. So 1 is here, so, and 1 that is the distance from the origin of the point 1 on the real axis, the point 1. Okay? So if I take a circle centered at A, Okay. Well, what I can say is that the image of this curve gamma with respect to h as a distance from 1 smaller than 1. So it is inside here. This is sigma. Maybe it's not like this, it, but it is far away from 0. So enough far, or far away. Enough far. Okay because of this inequality. Are you with me? Good. Now, 
With this geometrical description of the set of the curve of sigma, we can also say that where in the complement of sigma, okay, or say along, more, more correctly, in, uh, not in the complement, sorry, in a small neighborhood of the set sigma i, hmm, you can define the logarithm because we are far away from, from zero and we are in a ball. Huh? Correct? Remember that the logarithm can be defined, for instance, if you want the standard one. So you remove a slit like this from the plane. We are here with something which is inside here, but not passing through zero and not reaching this half plane. Right? So that we can define the logarithm. So logarithm, the complex logarithm is well defined is well defined in a neighborhood of sigma i. Sigma i is this, right? Is this curve. So I can see the small neighborhood and define the logarithm here without any problem. So one branch of the logarithm. So if they, the principal branch is defined. The problem of defining something which depends on the choice of like the, the previous considerations for the square root of z huh? is when you go to, uh, when you go to consider when you are considering say uh, a domain which contains zero and which goes around zero okay? so this is not the our case so logarithm is well defined. Good. Now I consider then as h of z is g of z over f of z, and then I restrict it to the curve gamma, right? So I take h prime of z, which is g prime of z times f of z minus f prime of z g of z over f squared of z. In other words, it is g prime of z over f of z minus f prime of z over, sorry, times g of z over f squared of z. Correct? So that I have that when I consider h prime of z over h of z, this is, so I have g prime of z over f of z minus f prime of z over f squared of z times g of z. And I have to divide everything times g of z over f of z. So this is first part reduces to g prime of z over g of z because I cancel f of z. I'm considering everything in general when it, when it is meaningful. Then when I restrict to the, the, the curve gamma when z of t is gamma of t, right? z is gamma of t. And I can simplify everything because gamma is not passing through zeros and poles, right? And then here, I simplify f, and I simplify g, so I have f prime of z, g of z. You see this? This is a simple calculation. Uh, sorry, f of z, right, sure. f cancel 1, f from here, g and g cancels. So when I consider, therefore, this number here, over the curve gamma, which is meaningful, as I said. Huh? This is the integral of a gamma, 1, 2 pi i, of g prime of z, g of z, dz, minus 1 over 2 pi i, 
integral over gamma of f prime of z over f of z dz. And here, here and also here, you can recognize what we have in, uh, in the principal, um, sorry, in the argument principal theorem stuff, right? So this would be the number of zeros of g referred to gamma minus the numbers of poles of g, right? And here, the numbers of zeros minus the numbers of poles, correct? On the right-hand side, I can calculate, so I have the difference, right? What do we have on the left-hand side? You might say, well, the number of zero of h, minus, no, yes, minus the number of poles, but I have something more. I can say that, well, this function here is that, what do I mean? It, it is, it has a primitive. It has a primitive because it is the, well, I can write this as <coughs> logarithm of h of z, the derivative of the logarithm. Why? Because, as I said, I can define, okay, the, in a neighborhood, okay, the complex logarithm. So this guarantees that this guarantees then since this integrand function is uh, has a, a primitive, the integral is zero on the left hand side. Okay, so this is zero because of this. And therefore we have the equality. So number of zeros of f minus number of poles of f is the same as the number of zero of g and the number of poles. Some application. Well, one basic application is not so trivial. It is another proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra. So let a number maybe 11, right? 12, sorry. So application. Another proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra. What is the, the, the trick point in appli in, when applying this theorem? Well, we have to find the correct inequality we have to use, right? Because not just, just because uh, you take f and g, meromorphic, holomorphic, it's not difficult to find pairs of holomorphic, but with the inequalities needed. So start from a polynomial p of z, and uh, of course you assume that the polynomial is not constant, so degree at least one, and it's not restrictive to assume that the polynomial is monic, because otherwise we divide so the first, the, the leading coefficient is one, okay? This mon means monic in case, okay? So assume that the degree of P is greater or equal to one, and that the, that AN is one, okay? But it's not, uh, without, without losing any generality in our consideration. So the polynomial is like this, AN minus one, ZN minus one, plus, plus, a1z plus a0, okay? This is our polynomial. Polynomial is holomorphic function. Very good. So it applies, the same consideration also applies for the case of holomorphic function because, as I said, holomorphic function represent a, a subset of meromorphic functions. So in this case, we don't only have zeros, no poles, but, okay? Call this pn minus one of z, that is to say p of z is Zn plus Pn minus 1 of Z. N minus one, N minus 1 reminds you that this polynomial here has degree N minus 1. Good. Now take this Pz 
minus Zn, that is to say Pn minus 1, and consider its modules. So this is smaller than Zn modules, at least for Z is far away from the origin. Well, how you can see this? Well, you see, you have that, sorry, this has degree n minus 1, pn. So if you divide by zn, pn minus 1 z over zn, as z tends to infinity, takes the modulus distance to 0, right? Because the degree of the denominator is larger than the degree of the numerator. OK? So for sure, this can be made smaller than something. And so the numerator is smaller than the denominator. Huh? So in a sufficiently large, uh, what, what is this, by the way? This is interesting to consider. For z greater than r, what is this set? It is the complement of a disk, right? Of a closed disk, to be more precise. Is it an open set in c? It is. If I want to, to use the, the, the point of view of the Riemann sphere, can I consider this to be a neighborhood of infinity? Yeah. Yes, it is. If you are not, say, somehow familiar with this vision, I say, oh, well, what is this? Well, this is neighborhood of infinity. Transform everything from outside to inside using 1 over z. So the stereographic projection, projection, and we have a disk, open disk at the origin. So the point at infinity is mapping to origin, and then we have neighborhood. Anyway, if we take a, as a curve a circle of radius r, and r is sufficiently large, then we have this inequality. This, this inequality holds for any z, so in particular, in particular, um, p of gamma t minus gamma t to the power n, smaller than gamma t power n, if gamma t is a r e i t and r is greater than capital R, right? And of course, t varies n to pi. Okay, so this is our i in the previous notation. So the interval. But then, count the zeros of this polynomial. How many zeros does it have? There's one zero counted with multiplicity n. n. Right? So there are n zeros. So if I say, I use the previous notation I have that the z f when f is z to the power n is n. And p, the number of poles, is 0. All right. So apply Rouchet theorem to this pair of holomorphic, in particular meromorphic functions, pz and zn. This is our, say, g, and this is our f. For f, we know everything. So we calculate explicitly the zeros. There is one zero with multiplicity n. About p, we don't know anything in, in principle. But we can conclude, since this inequality holds, that there are n zeros also for p. No poles. p is a polynomial inside one of this large disk. So all the zeros are in the plane. Hmm? So in fact, P of Z has n zeros. QED, right? All right. So another maybe trivial application is the following. Assume that we have a function holomorphic. And assume ND, say. 
and D is bounded uh, domain of C. Then I take A in D and I take G of Z to be F of Z, F of A minus F of Z. It's the same, right? Assume that we have this, that f of a has a modulus which is greater than f of z for any z in d. Remember that this leads to the fact that the f is constant because of the maximum modulus theorem, right? Remember this, a holomorphic function, any holomorphic function, okay, cannot have a point inside the domain of the definition such that its modulus is strictly greater than the others, right? So the, the, the maximum of the modulus of a holomorphic function can be taken only on the boundary. All right, so, and then I take this, okay, g of z and minus f of a is the modulus of f of z, right? which is smaller than f of a for our assumption, right? So what I conclude is that, well, assume that f is holomorphic, g is also holomorphic, so there are no poles in, in this case. So the number of zeros of f a is the same as the number of zero g of z. But there is only one, one uh, zero for g of z, it's a, right? And here there is none contradiction unless f is constant. So if we assume this, we have a contradiction from here. Let me also uh, uh, point out that the last time we used the, which is important to, 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 to see the, the same proof in different, with different approaches. So last time we've, uh, we, we saw the proof of the maximum modulus theorem as a simple consequence of the open mapping theorem, which is a very deep result, okay, which characterizes the topologically holomorphic functions. Um, but we can have the same result by applying the Cauchy integral formula, which is also a very important result and which it's good for, <laughs> for holomorphic function to be used several, as we have done several times. So assume that we have exactly, as in the, in the previous case, a point in, in the domain D, but it suffices to consider a small disk because we have local uh, integral Cauchy formula that this is guaranteed. Okay, so for instance, in D A R, F holomorphic, And this is the assumption. Okay, A is a point where the modulus of F is greater than F of Z, say for any Z in the AR. And this is always the case because, well, this is this should be called a local maximum for for the, 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 the function modulus of F, right? Since A is inside the domain of definition of F and F is holomorphic at A, then we always have the opportunity to, to, to take a small neighborhood of A inside the domain of definition, okay? Now, in particular, restrict our consideration to a curve gamma. So the curve gamma is, gamma of T is like this, A plus epsilon E I T, say, okay, two pi I T, okay? Just to be on the safe side. And epsilon is strictly smaller than R. So I take a circle inside D A R. And I can define F of A. This time I won't forget this, I hope. The integral over gamma of remember F of C, C minus A dx c, right? 1 over 2 pi i. I don't have to put the index 1 here because, well, it's 1, right? Because the index with respect to a, with respect to gamma of the point a is 1. 
right? Then this is just, as I said, this is nothing new for you, but just a, a way to see the same proof, same, to say the, the proof of the same result using another, another tool, okay, which can be interesting. So this is an equality, and this holds locally. So in particular, if I have this in general, this, this uh, assumption, generally it, we have it also locally, so we can apply it. Then, okay, taking the modules of f of a, this is, well, the modules of the integral on the right hand side. And this is smaller or equal of 1 over 2 pi, 2 pi, sorry. Uh, now this is, sorry, this is the same as, and then I, I replace gamma of t uh, into this. C is gamma of t. So that I have f of a plus epsilon e i 2 pi i 2 pi i t over the integral is between 0 and 1. Hmm? And then I have uh, epsilon e 2 pi i t, because a and minor, minus a cancel. And then I have here, instead of dx c, I have uh, what? Epsilon 2 pi i e 2 pi i t dt, right? Is dx c. One restricted to gamma. Huh? Epsilon 2 pi i, right? So I have epsilon 2 pi i, oh, sorry, e 2 pi i dt. So epsilon and epsilon, yeah, cancel, right? Am I right? What is missing? Hope nothing. Is it correct? So, to conclude, I have f of a is integral over 1 to pi i, or sorry, 0, 1, then I have f a plus epsilon pi i t and then I have e 2 pi i of course I forgot t that was probably what was uh, uh, okay uh, yes I uh, know so this cancel this and this cancel this right sorry but the, the 2 pi i t uh, <laughs> okay so this cancel and then I have this and then I apply the inequality so this is already gone, okay? The inequality integral, the modulus of the integral is small or equal to the integral of the modulus, and this is what will lead to a contradiction because this number here, this is a real number, because of this inequality is certainly smaller than f of a, right? Okay, so I have that this is f of a. It's an equality. This is strictly smaller than this. So, so this is the same thing smaller than this. Okay, contradiction. This is an, an interesting application of Ruscha theorem. And, well, finally, let me just sketch the next um, the next uh, uh, topic. So, uh, as we have seen, everything uh, in, uh, in complex analysis is somehow important locally. 
we define a function to be holomorphic in a, in a neighborhood of a point because we need to define something uh, like a complex differentiation. So some, some disks are required to be, to be the natural domain of definition, okay, in an, an instead of uh, a point. So it's not point, it's local. But when we have a singularity, we cannot use points. So a neighborhood of points. We have to, to use neighborhood puncture, puncture this, or neighborhood of singularities puncture. But unfortunately, the singularity as a point has the same problem, so it's better to enlarge what happens in, in a neighborhood of a, of a, of a singularity. We've seen that if you take a neighborhood of a singularity and the image is dense, and the complex plane, then necessity is an essential singularity. So what is natural to consider is not only this, but we prefer to take a small neighborhood of the singularity and then enlarge, if you want, the, the point to a disk and consider the analogs. Okay, so now the next next task is to try to 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 define power expansion in an analog, which would be so the natural extension of what we have uh, found for holomorphic to the case of meromorphic functions or functions which have a singularity at a more in general, right? So either A is a point where the holomorphic function is defined, or if it is not defined and then A is a singularity for the function, it is natural to consider neighborhood of this singularity and consider what is uh, the puncture disk without this neighborhood, that is to say uh, the analogs. So we'll consider the analogs centered at A and the radius R1 and R2. So it's the set of point Z in C such that R1 is smaller than Z minus A and smaller than R2. So all the Z's such that this inequality holds uh, are in A and vice versa, okay? So this defines nanos. Now, We consider two disks, sorry, two circles uh, in A, A, R1, R2, centered at A. Therefore, gamma 1 of t can be parameterized in the following way. A plus R2 E I T and T varies in 0 to pi. And I assume that R1 is smaller than R2, so we have two circles inside the analogs. This is R1 and R2. Since they are, we are in the analogs, we have this in a quad. R1 is smaller than R2 and capital R. One is smaller than capital, is smaller than R1, and capital R2 is greater than R2. So we are in, in the mid, in the in between. Hmm? Because of the, this choice of the parameterization, these two curves are oriented like this. Okay, moving from zero to two pi, and the index of a with respect to R1 is 1, with respect to, to, sorry, to gamma 1 is 1, with respect to gamma 2 is 2, okay? Index 1 over 2 pi i, the index, I always forget 1 over 2 pi i, okay? But what I meant was the form. Whereas all the other points outside the annulus, but not in this bounded component, of course, it has more index 0 for both curves. So I also noticed that geometrically I can deform gamma 1 into gamma 2 and vice versa. They are homotopic equivalent. 
right? So remark. Gamma 1 is homotopy to gamma 2 in A, A, R1, R2. Okay? So that I notice also that if I take gamma 2 minus gamma 1, and when I consider in gamma 2 minus gamma 1, I mean the same gamma 2 and then gamma 1 in the inverse sense of orientation of gamma. So if you want, you put minus t in front. Huh? in front, in, as a parameter, not in front, minus t, okay? This is also true. Uh, this depends on this. In fact, I have this and then this, okay? But then this set, this, sorry, this is uh, formal notation, means one curve considered with a positive orientation, one with a negative, but this is not a closed curve. This is not a closed curve. So I add and subtract, well look, this is somehow formal, but the segment, one of the segment connecting, segment of one curve, okay, connecting gamma, gamma 2 to gamma 1 in this way. So I enlarge the previous picture a little bit, and I try to show you what we are doing. As you can see, since uh, everything is uh, homotopic equivalent, and it's not important that they are circles, but, but it so that you, you are correct, but you can say that two functions are homotopic in general. Not to say, this is not a path, okay. right? These two functions are homotopic if you can, well, well, there is no starting and ending point. But now, if you, okay, I'm also answering you, and I, I choose one point and one other point on the other curve, right? So on the other circle, to be honest. And I take this to be lambda. So I put lambda, say this is gamma 2, and this is now gamma 1. So what I'm doing here is I move from here, start from this point, okay? Go around. Then I'll say, maybe this lambda is this. Then I go this way, then I move this way, and then I come back. Okay, so now I choose a, a, a point. Okay? Thank you for your question. But in general, you can, def you can define homotopy for continuous functions in, uh, in topological spaces without starting and ending point. If you have a path, if you say homotopies of path, then you normally require that the starting point and the ending point are preserved by the, by the but in general, okay? So what I'm, what I'm saying is that then finally this new curve gamma here is a closed curve in the analysis. okay? And because of this position, and it is homologous to zero. Homologous to zero is means that precisely what I've uh, written here, in the sense that if you consider any point, say for instance A, huh? take the index of A, and then any other point inside of this disk. I have an index zero, so because take the integral, this and this. So over, over this segment, over this curve, one contribution is cancelled by the other equivalent. And then you have one and minus one, zero. Outside, zero. So it is homologous to zero. So that I can finally say, why don't we apply Cauchy integral formula? Because now we finally have, we are in the, in the setting of Cauchy formula, Cauchy integral formula. And we take a z here in the two curves, huh? in the two circles, sorry, not the curve is one. Huh? <laughs> so I can say, well, take okay, 
1 over 2 pi i this is what is f of z times n gamma z. And this number here is what is the index of the curve gamma defined here for the point z, but z is here. So it is in the unbounded uh, um, component of a complement of gamma 1 and in the bounded component of gamma 2. Correct? So this integral, this or this index is 1. Therefore, we have this, okay, this can be omitted. We have this important formulation. And remember that as we have done for the holomorphic case, starting from this and using some uh, uniform convergence of, uh, of elements, we have found that any function with uh, this integral representation can be uh, uh, described in terms of power series. And then we'll see what happens okay, next time for functions defined in, 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 in with this integral formula inside an analog. So the idea is that we have to recover all the situation with singularities. So we have to expect to have power series expansion that with index x going from minus infinity to plus infinity so that we include all the cases. Okay? So if you start from only from a certain point, so from a certain a, a certain value minus m, then we have a pole at a. If we start from m equal to zero in the in the, in the summation of a power expansion, then we have a holomorphic function, so the, the singularity will be removable. But then if we have an infinite principal part so that the coefficients are not all zero from a certain, so not definitely zero from n minus m to minus infinity, then we have an essential singularity. So we'll see that with this, uh, this tool, the, the important tool of Cauchy integral formula, we can describe all the um, singularities and the expansion of a homomorphism in a neighborhood of a singularity. Okay? So I stop here and see you on Monday morning.